Welcome to another video from Cardboard East. My name is Jay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. I live in Taiwan and lots of people come to Taiwan to visit. And one of the common questions that I get is, Jay, I'm in Taiwan. What games should I buy? And one of the games that I always recommend is Pathogen. And here's why. Welcome to Pathogen. Pathogen is a two-player abstract game. It's going to be played between the plague, uh, represented here by the uh, plague witch doctor as well as the demon here and the doctor known as like well the plague doctor here and then the dove like creature here uh, now just for terminology for the rest of this introduction i'm just going to refer to these as red and blue so that way it won't be uh, too confusing for you there's only two ways to win which is very unique for an abstract game uh, the first way to win is to place one of your settlement houses uh, in each of the four quadrants here and each quadrant can only have at most two houses, like one for the blue, one for the red. Now you don't have to place uh, these houses on your tokens here. I just did that so it's a little bit easier to see because when I place them on the black here, it just kind of washes it out completely. So if a player is able to do this, then they win the game immediately. Uh, the other way to win is to take their tokens and if they're able to connect opposing sides. So for example, the red player can eventually throughout the course of the game, if they're able to place their tokens like this and bridge the left and the right, then they're able to win. It doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line. It could be, it could look something a little bit like this. If they are somehow able to bridge the opposing sides and they're able to win. It doesn't have to be left and right too. It could also be north and south. And if they're able to bridge it uh, some way, and this bridge could also include a settlement. If they're able to bridge it that way, then they win the game immediately. And that's how you win Pathogen. But how do you set up Pathogen and how do you play? Well, we're going to go ahead and get to that right now. So the first thing that you're going to do is the red player is going to take four of their tokens and then place them one in each quadrants of the board. Now this is for the first edition of the game. There is a Cardboard East variant uh, that I made that the publisher generously made uh, the official uh, second edition rule and that these four tokens uh, when you place them they have to be on opposite rows and columns. Like uh, they can't be, uh, no token can be on the same row or column as another token. In addition to that, they say that four tokens will be for the advanced play. If you're just beginning the game, maybe three. And if you want to have something a little bit more friendly and not as uh, tough, then you can use two. Now that's very similar to, I guess, Go, where you could have starting stones to kind of do a handicap. So for example, when I usually play the game, I'll let the player be a plague if it's the first time playing and I'll be blue and I'll let them start with four pieces out on the board because I can I can, I can handle that. Um, if the people are playing for the first time, maybe three or two is what I would recommend. For us, we'll just start with a standard three stone opening and we're gonna go like this. Then the blue player is gonna take one of their pieces, either the humanoid or the animal, and they're gonna place them on this board. Now the humanoids, can only be placed and they only move on the white squares. As far as they are concerned, these black squares do not exist. They do not interact with the black squares at all. Similarly, and in contrast, these animals, uh, they can only move on the black square and they only interact with the black squares. They do not interact with the white squares at all. To them, like they don't exist. So the blue player is gonna place uh, one of his pieces uh, anywhere on the board. And unlike chess, uh, there this isn't a you know, red side and blue side, the whole board belongs to everyone. So let's say the blue player is gonna place his starting piece uh, here. Uh, normally they would start it up, but I'm gonna place it here so you can see the board. And then the red player is gonna begin and place their piece uh, somewhere here. So let's say he's gonna place his starting piece here. And then I'm gonna place this one here and then the red will go here and then you're ready to begin the game and there's no rule about how many of these can be in the quadrant I mean they could all they could all be here together they just can't you know be on each other that's a that's a big no-no then we're gonna bring our focus to here then blue for his last action is gonna place this piece in any of these nine central squares on this board let's say he places it here and then we're ready to begin the game. Now, how you play the game is gonna be a little tricky. Uh, we're gonna explain this uh, to you in layers, so that way it'll be a little bit more approachable to you. But remember that your ultimate goal is to create a bridge, bridging with tokens the opposite sides of the board or dropping your four houses. So the first player is always the red, the red's always gonna move, and they're gonna take this red token and place it somewhere here on this board. Now, looking at this board really quickly here, uh, it's 
25 squares. These four corners here are black. That means no player can place their token here. The blue can only place in these nine central squares here. And the red player, if you notice that these side squares are red, that's because red can go there as well. So red can go to the nine, even the central place, and these 12 spaces outside. So we begin the game with blue choosing this location. And then now the red player is going to place this piece somewhere on the board. So let's say the red player will go here. Now, this, how this works is this will stay on here, saying like this is where it was previously placed. Red on their turn will go here, and then now he'll have to move this counter to this location. So let's say he'll go left and then up two. Now he can do this in any way he wants. He can do up two and then left one, or he can go like this. He just has to take the shortest path. And what does that mean? That means he just can't do all of this and then head back here. So if the shortest path is one, two, three squares, then he has to move one, two, three squares, but there is some flexibility for him to do that. So he's gonna go left and then up two. Now he has to mirror that exact movement on this main board. So he has to go left and then up two. If he looks at his demon, he goes left. He skips this white square, because remember he only moves on black. So one, up two. Well, that square doesn't exist. So this demon can't take that movement. You have to mirror this exactly. So, but this doctor can, this humanoid can. So left and up two, done. Now, the red player has four action points. And what they do is they take four tokens and they can place them on where they began and where in the path that they chose. And they have to spread these four tokens out as evenly as possible. So you see here, that's one, two, three. And then I can use this fourth one to place, well, anywhere I want. So let's say I place it here in the center. And then that is the end of the red player's turn, and it's now the blue player's turn. Now the blue player can take his piece here and then move to any of the remaining seven squares. He can't place it on the place where he was, he can't place it where the red player is, but he can place it uh, anywhere else that he wants to. So let's say the player, a blue player moves here, and now he has to move his piece a certain way. So you'd say one, two, and he's going to move this piece here, one, two. Now you can move over your opponent's pieces, you just cannot land on them. And then instead of four pieces, he has five units that he could do. And he doesn't have to spread them evenly because it's asymmetrical play. He can place them any way they want to. So let's say he drops five here. Now he can't drop any here because his opponent piece is there. So he'll just drop all five here on the board. And now it becomes the red player's turn. Now, in addition to that, I should also mention that the blue player has a very unique ability, unlike red. If blue places here, he has the option to rotate this any way he wants, and then he can move this action any way he wants to. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that the blue player is going to move like this. So he rotates the board here, and then he's gonna go up one and then to the right. And now he has to mirror that exact movement on the board. So he's gonna go up one and to the right. Now your player token can move on to places where your opponent has tokens, that's fine. And then now the blue player, again, has uh, five tokens that they have to deliver. And he can split this up any way he wants to. He doesn't have to do it evenly, unlike uh, the red player. So the red player has four, even. The blue player has five and he can mismatch any way he wants to. So let's say he'll place three here and two here. And then now it's the red player's turn. Now, if blue decides to lock on the center square, red cannot go to these outside squares on this turn. He has to stick to these eight central squares. And so red becomes a little bit tighter and they can't move quickly. So let's just say they move here and they go like that. And then red mirrors that exact movement on this board here, and then they drop four here. And that's pretty much how you play the game going back and forth. Now, what about these houses? Well, how these houses work is that, as you notice, as you can remember, there are three tokens here stacked up. If you ever get six tokens, so let's say, for example, if I had uh, three more tokens here, throw the rest of the game, I'm somehow able to get them there. I could remove that stack of six and I place this settlement here. Now, this little settlement is really important because one, it's one of the ways that you win the game because I'm able to build a settlement in each of the four quadrants and I win the game immediately. But 
It also means that the red player can no longer enter the square at all. Now remember, they can enter a square with their opponent's tokens, they can walk through a square with their opponent's piece, or this one anyway, because it's white square, but he can't enter this at all. So it creates like almost an obstacle for the other player, and they have to kind of walk around that. Now, in addition to that, when the blue player moves, let's say he just happened to move this way, he has five action pieces, and the blue player has to clean. That means if there are pieces of the red token's pieces in the way, then he has to clean that up. So that's one, two, three. Five minus three is two. That leaves him two more spaces that he plays tokens. And let's say he just places them on those spaces there. So in addition to dropping a token, you could also clean an opponent's token off the board. And that gives you that little bit of back and forth. If you're the blue player, you have to clean. If you're the red player, you do not have to clean. And that essentially is how you play Pathogen, but it's not how you play Pathogen well. To get more into that, we're gonna go back up top and I'm gonna let you know my thoughts. Components. These tiles are really thick and the fact that you get like even more of them is fantastic. So there's a lot of replay value and they're all double-sided. So it's pretty much a different map uh, every time you play. Also, like all of these are nice wooden components, painted, silk screened, really, really good. And even the, uh, the pieces that you have all look really nice. One negative that I have uh, with the components is this dove angel piece. It sucks. I don't know how else to say it. It's nice. It's because it's top heavy. And I have never, never played a game where this didn't fall over. It has fallen over every single game that I've played. And I kind of wish that instead of having it being top heavy like this, I think the bottom of the token should have kind of gone out a little bit more so it'll be a little bit more stable. That's just like a mild, mild, little annoying thing. One of my friends who has this game, he just likes to take it and just put it upside down because he just can't even bother with it anymore. I like that it's, you know, black and white. So it kind of reminds you kind of like, like a chessboard, but I really love how there's artwork on here. And you can't really tell, uh, I guess, through the camera, but when you look really closely, like these white squares have like this living world and like this black squares have like this deadly death plaguey world and it's really 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 nice quality moving on to what ui user interface the only thing here is all the the player cards now these these are not great it does what it does like it kind of reminds you of what you can do and some of the asymmetrical play styles that you have of this but I think it could have done a better job. And I understand you want to have it to where it's not language dependent. So that way it's just easier for other publishers and people to play it. But after, honestly, after your first game, like I, I just take these and just leave them in the box. I, I don't need them. Gameplay. Why do I love this game? This is a game that will never leave my collection. And I want to talk to you a little bit about why. And I think the reason is, is in one word, layers and we're going to break down those layers for you and tell you why I love this game so much. Uh, one of the things is this movement board and I love that this is where all the action units take place and then it's represented here on the board. I think that's a really clever design and something that I haven't really seen before and I would like to see more of. But outside of that there's this other layer that you don't realize as you you taught the game. You have to be really careful. One thing that you find out is that if both of your pieces are on the same side of the board well then you can kind of get locked in here. Like you can't move your pieces and it can get really really frustrating and that's just one layer of the game. You can position yourself to kind of block your opponent and force them to move. So as you're moving to kind of perpetuate your ideas and what, what you want to do, you also can pin your opponent and hinder their movement. That's a different layer to the game that I didn't see the first time I played it. In addition to that, uh, Blue's ability to go here to the center and then rotate is really, really powerful. Not only because the preceding turn, uh, the red player has to be tightened up and they can only move uh, a little bit, but because uh, it allows you to rotate that board and rotate your movement and prevents you from being stuck. And I think that the first time that I played this game, like I didn't realize how important moving to the center was. And now that I play the game, I go to the center 
quite a bit. One of my friends who said like, well, I always play like the virus always wins. Like, okay, let's play. I'll play the doctor. And I destroyed them because I went to the center all the time. And he suddenly realized that he hadn't been doing that as much as he should have. And I like the extra layer to the game. There are ways for the doctor to win and he has tricks at his disposal. One of the most important tricks is moving to the center, rotating your movement and locking in the virus. And in addition to this movement that's here, I love the layer of the white and black squares. I love that you have two pawns working together that never meet each other. And it creates this really interesting movement dynamic. And because of the way the board is shaped, going from here to here might not be that easy as a straight line. You might have to go around just to get to there. And it gets really, really frustrating. And you have to make these pawns work together. Like you can never make a straight line, your bridge, to win the game with just one character. You have to use both of them. And I find that a really interesting layer uh, to the game. Now, I love that there are two winning conditions because typically I see the bridge or people connect to opposite sides of the board. Very rarely, I think only once, have I seen someone build four of their houses. But I like that that ability exists. And typically when I play this game now, I play with people who've played a bit, that they put their houses in very strategic locations because you once the house is built, your opponent can't even walk through it. And depending on how the map is shaped, there can be really important squares that if you block your opponent, it makes traversing the map much more difficult. So I see this more as a defensive maneuver, but it's really interesting that that's there. And I think it adds a lot a lot to the gameplay. But like the best layer is the asymmetrical play because they both play very, very differently. At the beginning of the game, uh, the red player starts off pretty strong because they already have board presence and they're just dominating that early part of the game. And as a doctor, you are trying to clean as much as you can to stay alive. And then if you stay alive long enough, it gets to the mid game. And because the doctor has more actions, He's able to clean more and drop a few seeds along the way, hoping that those will blossom to uh, winning conditions. And it kind of becomes a little bit more paired. But at the end of the game, the doctor is just far more powerful. Just because they have more actions at that point. They have, you know, five as opposed to four. And I really like that shift in power uh, in the game. So you're pushing hard as Pathogen to get that early win. And as a doctor, you're fine to stay alive and you'll be stronger uh, by the end of the game. And I really like that uh, layer to the game. And it makes playing the red player fun and the doctor also fun. And I like that you can enjoy playing both. Well, at least I do. Now, when I first played this game, I did mention to the publisher that I'm gonna put it on BGG for my own personal uh, house variant, was that when you do the setup of the game, you want to have red's pieces be on, never on the same row and column. And that is a subtle change, but it, it can be pretty important because if you had two of these on the same row, the board do the different positioning, like you could probably win the game uh, as the pathogen player, like by the second turn. And I think by separating that off center on it just a little bit kind of alleviates alleviates that problem. I'm really happy to see that they've made that uh, as part of the rule book now for the second printing and that's how you're supposed to set up. In addition to that, I like that there's an extra layer here for setup or handicaps because this is the type of game where if you're an advanced player and you have a new player, the advanced player is going to smoke you. There's just, there's just no way around that. I like that with this game, there's a way to handicap yourself. So typically when I play the game with someone who hasn't played it before, I will play the doctor and I'll let them uh, play as the pathogen player and begin with four pieces uh, on the board. Now, I find that three pieces starting off on the board is guessed for when people are about the same. Two is for uh, very easy mode and four is for difficult. And I like that you could adjust that for differences in player strength. Similar to Go, what Go does with the starting stones. Now, part of the complaints that I've seen people say is like, well, the, the red player is just way too strong, the doctor is just way too weak. And I'm like, no, no, you wait a second here. And I think the reason why, and I notice uh, people who say that is typically when they're playing the doctor, they're just too occupied with like placing their tokens down and they're not spending any time cleaning. And I think at the beginning of the game, as the doctor, you really need to be cleaning those play tokens as much as possible. Like every single turn you're cleaning. Otherwise, uh, they'll just, you won't be able to catch up and, and stay afloat. And once you're able to do that, 
I think that you will play the game a little bit better. Now, what's really interesting about this game is that that actual, that final layer is just the patterns. The patterns of how the board is arranged, the patterns of the movement, patterns of the tile placing, recognizing those patterns and knowing what you should do really makes this game a lot of fun. And there's a lot of depth through the simplicity of mechanics here. But my favorite thing about Pathogen is that all those layers add to the player experience. So as you play this game, as you're learning the game, you're revealing more and more layers as you play the game and you're seeing more combinations and more patterns. And I find that really, really rewarding. Every time you play this game, you will get better and you'll see those patterns emerge uh, through the gameplay, kind of like hidden in there. And while the teach is a little tricky, once you get past it, I think there's a lot of game here to reward you. And I find that really, really special for abstract games. This is one of the best games to ever come out of Taiwan. And when I do my top 20 list, you will see this one on that list for sure. And that is why I love Pathogen. Once again, gamers, my name's Shay. I play board games from Asia and share what I find with all of you. I'm going to put some links up here, some videos that I think you'll enjoy. See you there.